Hello students, let us continue our discussion on using the thermodynamic principles in understanding some of the very complex processes in biological systems. And in today's lecture, we are going to talk about how endergonic reactions or reactions with positive change in Gibbs free energy are driven uh, inside our body and uh, how uh, nature uses high energy compounds like ATPs and NADH in doing so. So, uh, let me uh, remind you that we have talked about the oxidation of organic compounds uh, belonging to the groups of carbohydrates, fats and proteins and their oxidation actually provides a multi-step uh, complicated chain of processes which produces in the intermediate step reduced species such as this nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide with a complex structure like this and it also produces adenine triphosphate with complex structures like this. Now, as you understand that the presence of these many bonds are actually indicative of the fact that if I can break some of these bonds, then they will provide the energy required for use further down the chain. Now, the importance of these reduced species is that they are uh, capable of undergoing changes. So, they are reduced species, they will get converted to their corresponding oxidized version or uh, in this case it will lose one phosphoryl group to produce energy that can be used in driving some of the processes such as the ones in biosynthesis of large molecules or biosynthesis of small molecules, actual motion of the overall human body and also transport of ions and molecules. I will take some specific example today just to show you how the high energy content of ATP molecule and the energy released by them is used up in our body to drive endergonic reactions. So, let us first examine the standard enthalpy changes in hydrolysis of ATP. So, this is the structure of ATP and ATP upon hydrolysis goes into ADP the same structure, but with one less uh, phosphoryl group and this upon hydrolysis releases another phosphoryl group producing AMP the monophosphate. Now, when I am looking at the standard enthalpy changes of hydrolysis of these three molecules, I must mention that the definition of a biological standard state is quite different from what we have seen before. Previously, we have seen that the, uh, the standard state condition has pressure equal to 1 bar and uh, we usually uh, 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 employ a temperature of 298 Kelvin and an activity of uh, solids as 1 and activity of water then will depend on the condition under which you are uh, using the system. But in the biological standard states, we use pH equal to 7 and also the uh, log to the base 10 of the concentration of the magnesium ion with a negative sign that should be equal to 3. And in uh, close uh, connection to the environment in our body, the ionic strength is specified to be 0.25 molar. So, under these conditions which are pretty different from the usual standard state conditions that we have employed in the case of gases uh, or uh, in uh, case of simple solutions, we look at how much heat is released as 
one mole of ATP undergoes hydrolysis. So, here is an ex the, the um, amount mentioned over here. So, you find that when one mole of ATP reacts with one mole of water that produces ADP plus one phosphate group which is a inorganic phosphate and therefore, it has been given the short and uh, shorthand notation P i. The release of the phosphate group in the solution that gives you an, uh, 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 an evolution of energy. This is an exothermic reaction and you find that nearly about minus 31 kilojoules per mole of energy is released. And this is the highest amount of energy released when ATP undergoes progressive hydrolysis of its phosphoryl groups. So, once again let me uh, highlight that the loss of this terminal phosphoryl group has resulted in the release of the uh, energy which is equal to about minus 31 kilojoules per mole. Now, if ADP undergoes hydrolysis, then I understand that there will be energy released upon expulsion of this terminal phosphoryl group and that amount is about minus 29 kilojoules per mole. And if I go ahead and try the expulsion of the final phosphoryl group, so AMP that is, uh, uh, that is adenosine monophosphate undergoing hydrolysis, it gives you adenosine plus inorganic phosphate and here only a very small amount of heat is released. So, now I see three reactions starting from the molecule ATP and this tells me that the hydrolysis results in release of energy because of the scission of the terminal phosphate groups. These are uh, spontaneous under, uh, uh, no, I should not say spontaneous, these are exothermic therefore, energy releasing reactions which we expect would be used in driving the biological processes. But as you know that in order to find out whether they are uh, spontaneous or not, we should examine the quantity not the enthalpy, but the standard Gibbs free energy of hydrolysis. Now, under the biological standard state, we find that all the three reactions are highly exorgonic, which means that all of them are associated with large negative values of standard Gibbs free energy. So, I would say that in our body under the standard conditions, all these three reactions are going to be spontaneous. And of these, the hydrolysis of ATP is going to be associated with the largest decrease in the standard Gibbs free energy upon hydrolysis. Now, with this information in hand, we can go ahead and look at the very first reaction which is the uh, in uh, anaerobic glycolysis which requires glucose to be converted to glucose 6 phosphate. And this reaction is uh, catalyzed by the enzyme hexokinase and in general is referred to as the hexokinase reaction in anaerobic glycolysis. So, what is this reaction? You find that glucose when it combines one mole of glucose when it combines with one mole of inorganic phosphate, it gives rise to glucose 6 phosphate and produces one mole of water. And if you look at the associated value of standard Gibbs free energy of uh, this reaction, you find that this is plus 11.6, which tells me immediately that under standard condition, this reaction is not going to be spontaneous at all. And at the same time, I find that the amount of heat released over here is 
very small. So, obviously, nature has to do something else to drive this reaction. So, what will happen here is this reaction will get coupled to the hydrolysis of ATP, whereby we see that the change in standard Gibbs free energy in this reaction is much uh, larger with a negative sign. Therefore, coupling of these two reactions would eventually result in a net negative value of delta G naught reaction and that is exactly what we see. Therefore, if I allow the glucose to be converted to glucose 6 phosphate in the presence of ATP, ATP uh, uh, hydrolysis of ATP will provide the necessary driving force to overcome the uh, unfavorable change in Gibbs free energy for the reaction where the glucose combines with inorganic phosphate to produce the glucose 6 phosphate. Now, look at this uh, value of uh, standard Gibbs free energy of reaction, it is nearly about minus 21 kilojoules per mole. So, basically just like uh, you have to switch, uh, uh, switch on a refrigerator to cool down the system from the room temperature to a much lower, uh, uh, lower uh, temperature. Here you are switching on ATP hydrolysis, so that an otherwise non-spontaneous process now becomes spontaneous at the cost of the uh, energy provided by the ATP hydrolysis. And this is the reason why ATP is called the energy currency of the uh, energy currency of metabolic processes. And here you see that not only it has uh, made the process uh, spontaneous, but also because of the coupling of the two, the substantial amount of uh, heat has also been released in this process. Now, if I go over and look at what else we can do from this particular, uh, these particular uh, thermodynamic values, I can also find out the efficiency of this process at equilibrium by calculating the equilibrium constant. So, let us have a look how we can find out the equilibrium constant for this process at uh, t equal to 298 Kelvin. I uh, know from our previous discussion of chemical thermodynamics that if you know the standard Gibbs energy of a given reaction, you can find out the associated equilibrium constant as exponential of negative of a ratio of the standard Gibbs free energy of the reaction divided by R t. And in this uh, particular case, this equilibrium constant is found to be 5 into 10 to the power of 5 under standard conditions. Now, once you know this, the basic idea is this not only tells you about the ratio of the product and the reactants under standard conditions and how they are going to affect the subsequent steps. It also tells you that what happens to the metabolic composition of the different uh, steps uh, in our body when the temperature changes. If I want to understand the temperature dependence of this equilibrium constant, I can use the Van't Hoff's equation and then I find that an essential part of doing this evaluation would be knowing the standard enthalpy of reaction, which for this reaction is already available to you. So, let us do the following. Let us assume that at T 1 equal to 298 Kelvin, K 1 is equal to 5 into 10 to the power of 5. Let me also assume that T 2 is 310 Kelvin, the physiological temperature and then I can write down ln k 2 that is equal to ln k 1 
minus the standard enthalpy of reaction divided by the universal gas constant multiplied by now 1 by T 2 minus 1 by T 1 and here I would like to remind you that this particular working formula employs temperature in the Kelvin scale. So, what I will do is according to the given numbers I will put the value of K 1, I will put the value of delta H naught R and T 2 and T 1 and this will immediately give me that the logarithm of ln k 2 is equal to this number multiplied by a small uh, uh, minus a small number giving me eventually a number close to 12.8 thereby representing that k 2 that is the equilibrium constant for this reaction at 310 Kelvin would be 3.6 into 10 to the power of 5. Now, did we expect an equilibrium constant which is less compared to the equilibrium constant at lower temperature? As you see that this is in exact correspondence to the La Chatelier principle. This particular equilibrium is an uh, it corresponds to an exothermic reaction. In an exothermic reaction, if you are increasing the temperature, then the system will try to shift the equilibrium in the direction in which the extra heat will be absorbed. And therefore, I would expect the products to be converted back to the reactants more as a result of which the equilibrium constant will undergo a reduction in the value and that is exactly what we are observing here. So, here what we, are, we have seen is the fact that glycolysis is actually involving the conversion of glucose to glucose 6 phosphate which then converts to 2 glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and this again requires the input of not ATP, but the input of NAD plus getting converted to NADH giving you some other product which eventually gets converted to pyruvate. Okay. Now, this entire uh, uh, cycle that requires in some steps the participation of ATP, in some steps the participation of NAD plus. Let us have a look at how some of these steps which are otherwise uh, anargonic are being uh, made uh, spontaneous by coupling with the hydrolysis of ATP. For instance, I have already shown you how glucose couples to the hydrolysis of ATP giving you glucose 6 phosphate plus ADP with delta G is a highly negative number and even delta G naught is also a negative number. But the next step requires the glucose 6 phosphate to be get converted to fructose 6 phosphate. Now, if you look at fructose 6 phosphate, then you see that delta G naught is a positive number and delta G in this case is a small negative number. Therefore, automatically you would understand that this uh, fructose 6 when it tries to get converted to a fructose 1 6 biphosphate, this conversion is spontaneous under normal physiological conditions, but this one requires one mole of ATP to get converted to fructose 1 6 biphosphate whereby it is converted to a spontaneous reaction ex, uh, exergic reaction. And similarly what happens is you can see how in the subsequent steps if there are small uh, 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 requirements of positive delta G on the whole glucose 
utilizes 2 moles of ATP to get converted to 2 moles of ADP and generate 2 moles of glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate, which eventually gives you a very large negative delta G. So, if you think about it as a trip down the mountain side, then you start at the peak, then using the uh, glucose uh, the, the ATP, you it is mostly downhill, but sometimes you can have small uh, barriers which can be eventually overcome because of the final downhill progress in free energy. In the second part, once again, the mostly downhill journey in free energy continues, so that the entire process whereby glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate is converted to pyru uh, lactate is becoming spontaneous not only under standard conditions, but also under the given reaction condition. So, what we have seen here is the general principle that a thermodynamic process at a finite temperature and pressure is spontaneous if it is associated with a lowering of the Gibbs free energy. And here we have seen that there are several complicated processes in biology within our body as a part of metabolism that may not be spontaneous under the given conditions. So, how does the body then drive these processes? The body couples these endergonic reactions with ATP hydrolysis, whereby the two coupled processes result in a negative value in the uh, change in Gibbs free energy of reaction and overall process becomes exergonic and hence spontaneous. Thank you.